When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have put into place, what is man that you consider him? Yet, yet, you've made him just a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. That's who you are because of who he is. It is so wonderful to be here this morning. You, uh, Pastor Felix mentioned my, my wife, Colleen. We've been married 33 years. When, uh, when I was in college, when I was in college, uh, my dad stopped by my dorm room and said, hey, you should, you should ask out this uh, Colleen Foster. She's a nice gal. And when I heard nice gal, all I could think is buffalo gals, won't you come out tonight? And uh, yeah, that's what I thought. And I hadn't met her yet, Derek. I hadn't met her yet. And so it was like, you know, how many young men, you know, you think your, your dad doesn't know anything, you know, when you're really young. And that's where it was. And then a week later, I met her and it was like, Dad, you knew what you're talking about. And, uh, and she's been just a, a tremendous blessing. And uh, some of you remember my son, Daniel. He now is a, a graduate of, of college, and uh, he's a youth pastor over in Lakewood. Half of his youth group are on probation, and he's reaching kids through the court system, which is really exciting. And uh, he's, he's got that, that, that Bryce... Uh, Harper, you know, he's the, the uh, outfielder for the Washington Nationals, and he's got a shaved head and then big hair on the top. That's, that's my son with the, with the beard and so forth, the hipster kind of thing. He, he has a lot of hair like his mom, not like his dad. And, uh, and he and his wife are having a baby next month, and so we're going to be grandparents for the first time. And... Uh, He's a youth pastor, so he doesn't make much money, so they live in our basement right now. She's a school teacher, and so we're going to have a baby living with us, and uh, they brought their dog, who, who wakes me up at 6 a.m., a miniature schnauzer by the name of Baxter, and uh, he lives with us. Our, our middle daughter graduated from CU Denver a couple years ago with a business marketing degree, and she works for a business in Santa Monica, California, just, just two blocks away from the Pacific Ocean. That's really rough, isn't it? And, uh, and she lives in North Hollywood. She attends uh, the Mosaic Church, Erwin McManus's church in, in Hollywood, and, and she's just having a, a blast there. She has in front of it, she has this little 400-square-foot house that's, that's in the backyard of this other house in North Hollywood, and that's what she rents. And in front of it is a statue of Michelangelo, uh, his David statue. And so it, it's this uh, white marble, naked white guy. And, uh, and so we, we say that that's her boyfriend, and we have a lot of fun with that on it. And then my youngest is here, Elizabeth, and she graduated. She's like her mother. She's just very beautiful. And uh, uh, she just graduated from CU Colorado Springs last week with her Bachelor of Science in Nursing. So she'll be an RN. And... Uh, her fiancé is flying back from Brazil. They met down in the Springs. He was a foreign exchange student. He's an engineering student. His name is Pedro, and he is a handsome devil. And, uh, and, and so have, have you seen that movie? It's, it's animated, that movie Inside Out, where it's about people, what they're thinking in their brains, and there's anger and happiness and all these. You remember that? And, uh, and in part of that movie, the, the mother of the little girl uh, is angry with her husband, and so you, you read her body language, then inside you see her thinking, and, and she's looking at her husband like you're an idiot. Husbands, you know that look, don't you? And, uh, and then inside, in, in the, on the screen of her, of her brain, is a picture of a Brazilian, and she said, man, I could have married the Brazilian helicopter pilot. Do you remember that scene in Inside Out? And then he looks at her, uh, the helicopter pilot, he's a handsome Brazilian guy with a helicopter behind him, and he goes like this, and he goes, come away with me, Kachina. And uh, that guy in that movie looks like Pedro. That, that's what Pedro looks like. And so the big thing we say to, uh, to Elizabeth is, come away with me, Kachina. And, and so they're gonna have some, we're going to have some beautiful grandchildren because she has very light skin, blue eyes, and, and then he's got dark skin, dark eyes, and they're just going to have some beautiful babies. And so we're, we're so blessed. 
And uh, I, I, uh, Pastor Felix told me that he's been speaking about the, the tree, the fig tree, that uh, is uh, not bearing fruit, and how the, the servant said to the master, saying, would you dig around it for another year, give it another year, and see if it'll be fruitful. There's, there's three thoughts I want to give you on that. And the first one is this, because I grew up in Washington State around a lot of orchards, and Colleen, my wife, grew up in Southern California where there was orange orchards and there were apple orchards up in Washington State. And one of the things about fruitfulness is when an orchard is, is in the season of bearing fruit, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And we need to capture or recapture a vision of following Jesus, of walking in the kingdom of God, where we realize that we're not walking away from the good stuff to do the religious stuff that we need to do, but it's not in our best interest. We're moving away from the things that eventually they look shiny and nice, but they're like a snake. They bite and devour. Satan came to kill, steal, and destroy. And so drugs, for instance, there's this wonderful high, you know, floating away. I, I got hurt playing football growing up, and, and I remember when they took me to the, to the hospital and, and I needed to have a, a surgery, you know, they gave me some drugs. I don't know what it was, but, but I was in all this pain, and all of a sudden I started floating away, and he was like, oh, this is really nice. <laughs> this is so nice. Thankfully, I didn't know what it was, so I couldn't find it. Uh, <laughs> But what happens? Next thing, you're in a trailer that's filled, that smells like hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're moving toward when an orchard is bearing fruit, when you see an orange orchard, an apple orchard, you look at it and you go, that's beautiful. And when our lives are fruitful, they're beautiful. Yeah. Second thing is when an orchard is bearing fruit, it's valuable. Look it up, Google it. But the worldwide Apple uh, economy, revenue, is probably close to a billion dollars a year. In other words, when we're being fruitful, the fruit of the Spirit, in our lives, it's not only beautiful, but it's something that is worth a lot. And so if we want to improve what we're worth in the marketplace, yeah, thank you. I didn't know what to do about it. <laughs> so I thought I'd just ignore it. I still hear it. You'll get it? Okay, sorry. Is it just me? <laughs> okay, because it was like, did I show up? Because if, if there's a demon attached to PA systems, that demon likes me an awful lot. I go different places and people go, it never happens this way. After you hear that, after about 10 different places, you begin to think, well, it's me, you know? I don't have a pacemaker, you know, so I don't, I don't know what, I look like I need one, but I don't. And, uh, but valuable, and valuable because of the third thing, the third thing. When an orchard is bearing fruit, the fruit is not for the orchard, the fruit is for the market. In other words, you're valuable, first of all, just because you're made in the image of God. But we have to be practically valuable. But when we're bearing fruit, we're practically valuable because we're bringing something that is of worth to other people. And that's what Jesus did. Now he has a name above all names because why? He set aside his rights as a son of man and came to serve. He came to serve, not to be served, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, we understand that the, we're more valuable in the marketplace when we bring greater value to the marketplace. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I just want to encourage you. To think that God's ways are not the best ways. But they are. They're not the easiest ways. But they're the best ways. Because things that are really of value are things you have to work hard for. I don't know about you, but I, I st I'm still excited about our Super Bowl win. I, I didn't... 
after the smackdown that the, the Seahawks put on us, I came into this Super Bowl really, really worried. And Cam Newton, he did look like Superman. You got it this last season. I mean, did he look good or not? And so we went into this, and, 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 and Peyton Manning looked like he was disabled. <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, his, his, it, looked, it looked like an extra point, you know? Like this, and he was like, boy, we're going to. And in the Seahawks Super Bowl, that game was over with with the first, with the first hike that went over his head, right? In fact, did you hear what uh, Seahawks fans did during the second half? Oh, oh, excuse me, did you hear what the Seahawks fans did when the Super Bowl was over? They watched the second half. Yeah. But Peyton Manning and Von Miller, Von Miller, he looked like Superman in that. They work extremely hard, and because they did, the payoff is that much sweeter. So this morning, I want to tack on to what Pastor Felix has been teaching you about being fruitful. And first of all, can, can we begin to, by the Holy Spirit, begin to capture the hopefulness of being fruitful? That in being fruitful, I become more beautiful from the inside out. And that's what we need. we got a culture that's telling us that beauty is just skin deep. No, it's not. In fact, Abraham Lincoln said this. He said, after the age of 50, you get the face that you deserve. <laughs> and so beauty comes from the inside out, right? That's who we are. That's who I am. Amen. And so fruitfulness makes us more beautiful. In the, in the wonderful, have you ever seen, my mother is 96 years old. She still scares me. She, I, I wish she was here. I wish you could meet my mother. She would have loved this worship time. And uh, uh, my mom, though, she's 96 years old. She used to be 5'6". She's now about 5'2". She used to be, I don't know what she weighed. I mean, you know, who, she was my mother. I don't know how much she weighed. Now she probably weighs 90 pounds. She is small. Her hair is white. Her skin is, is wrinkly and so forth. But she shines. See, her body is wearing out, but her soul is beginning to shine more and more. And thankfully, these bodies don't last forever, but we're getting a better body. And so fruitfulness, first of all, is to make us more beautiful in the real sense of the word. Have you met people that shine from the inside? doesn't matter what they weigh. You just are captivated by the beauty that shines out of them, the glory of that. And then the second thing, it helps us to bring more value and to fulfill the destiny that God has for us. God doesn't make anything that isn't of tremendous value. I wish I could preach just on that. I'll have me back, and I will. On that. And then the third thing is that it is more value because we're bringing more value. What the fruit that we are bearing in our lives is for other people. Kindness is not something for myself. Kindness is something I give someone else. Patience is what I give someone else. Now, here's the deal. It is not natural in this world to bear fruit. The environment in this world is not conducive for bearing fruit. I'm on the board of Eden Reforestation Projects, and in 2010, Pastor Felix and I went to Ethiopia together, and, and Eden has planted in Ethiopia and in Madagascar, in Nepal, and then also in Haiti over 120 million trees and have employed thousands of people that were unemployed previously. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. But one of the things is sometimes soil, for whatever reason, is such that it's toxic to the plants. And so anyone who has an orchard understands that you have to take care of the soil. Now the problem many times for us spiritually is the soil of the world is, not, is toxic to the fruit of God. First John says it this way, says that we have three enemies. We have uh, the evil world system, we have Satan, and then we have our own sin nature. 
But we can overcome all of those by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, by the filling of the Holy Spirit, by fellowship with one another, where we are to be a fellowship that builds one another up rather than tears one another down. See, I, I'm, I'm here this morning, and I, I pray that somehow through a, a very simple person from Snohomish, Washington, small town, that God will come and will bless you. Because, you see, preaching isn't about the preacher. It's about being a servant for the blessing of others. And as we bless others, what happens is we are blessed. So one of the reasons of a worship gathering is to begin to change the soil of our lives from the toxicity. I mean, are you fed up with the acrimony of our presidential election? I haven't agreed 100% with, our, with all the policies of our present uh, President Obama, but let me tell you something. He's head and shoulders above the two candidates. We, I'm sorry, I'm going too far. I shouldn't get into... Yeah. Thankfully, our trust is in the king rather than in the president. Because, and, and also, I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe one of them will do a good job. I, I pray they will. If they do, God answers prayer. <laughs> okay. At Talbot Seminary in Southern California, a course I took was with Dr. Neil Anderson. Maybe you've read some of his books, The Bondage Breaker, Victory Over the Darkness, where he talks about deliverance. And when he talks about deliverance, he's talking about spiritual warfare, overcoming principles and powers, overcoming demons. They're very real. That are always constantly trying to take uh, arrows into our hearts and into our minds, into our soul, pulling us away from fruitfulness. Trying to poison the soil of our soul. And he said that there are certain things that lead to that toxicity, that, that, uh, that poisoning of the soul, soil of our soul. And one of them I want to talk about this morning from Jonah chapter 4. And it is bitterness. It is bitterness. It is resentment. Some of us have gone through experiences in our life that are very traumatic and can be life-altering. We're seeing that more and more with our GIs coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan that have post-traumatic stress disorder and they just have this huge weight of brokenness that they have to overcome. Some of us can relate to that because rape, for instance, can lead to the same kind of symptoms. So there can be large traumatic events that can happen to us that then Satan wants to turn that into toxicity into the soil of our soul so that we can't bear fruit and we're unhappy. Amen. And we would make other people unhappy because we are unhappy that we are unhappy and so we don't want anybody else to be happy. Hmm? And then some of us haven't gone through those kind of traumatic things, but it's, it's, it's kind of like dying of a thousand paper cuts. Where you have a relative and you go, I've been listening to their stuff for 30 years now. And they're on my last nerve. So you see, there can either be the big bitterness kinds of things, or there can be the small foxes of irritations. If you turn in your Bibles to John, Jonah chapter 4. Jonah was a captive to bitterness. Jonah chapter 4. It is me. If you notice, when I pull it away from my body, it stops. So it's, it's, it's me. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I have said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away my life. It is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down 
at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, the Lord provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die, and he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said, I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. In other words, 120,000 children that are so young, you go, raise your left hand, and they go like this. They, They don't know. And many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Now, now, Jonah, first of all, had every right to be bitter because the Assyrians had been, they, they were the ISIS of their day. And they went to Jerusalem and they did a scorched earth kind of warfare there. Uh, they raped, they pillaged, they cut open pregnant women and took out the babies. Uh, they, the, the, the king, it, it tells us, Uh, His sons were killed in front of him, then they poked his eyes out, and then they put him in chains, and then they led him on a walk that was about 700 miles to Nineveh. Those were the Assyrians. Now, when that had happened that I just described was about 30 to 35 years prior to this, what we just read. So in other words, Jonah had nursed his grudge and and his resentment for over 30 years. And if you noticed in this scripture right here, it, it tells us the negative consequences because Jonah chose to live in bitterness rather than in forgiveness. And you see, forgiveness is the fertilizer that can take poisonous soil and turn it into fruitful soil. If you try to grow your life In the soil of bitterness, you're not going to get a good crop. You're not going to get a beautiful crop. You're not going to get a valuable crop. You will get a bitter crop. You'll get a broken crop. We have to change the soil to be able to change the fruit. And so one of the things we see here is one of the consequences of of Jonah living in bitterness is that it began to put him on a path that separated him little by little from God. He still believed in God, but yet God, he, he was choosing, choosing to go on a pathway of bitterness, and God is not a bitter God. And so when Jonah was walking on this path of bitterness, he's walking on a path that God does not live on. God doesn't live on that street of bitterness. God lives on the street of grace and mercy and compassion. So what was happening is, little by little, he's separating from God. The other thing is he isn't able to heal. It's interesting to see what God did there. God gave him this vine. God blessed him. But then God was willing to take away the blessing that he had given Jonah to reveal what was in Jonah. And that, and God is willing to do that even in our lives. He give, gives us blessings because he's a good God. That's who he is. But he is the most concerned about who you are deep within your soul because he loves you so much. And if he needs to withhold or take back some of those blessings to reveal to you what is in your heart. You see, with Jonah, there's this worm, and all of a sudden the vine, he's like, I got this vine, it's a desert out here. I, I'm not, you know, if I'm bald, you know, I'm not getting scorched up here and so forth. And Life is good. And then it says in the scriptures that he provided a worm and the worm ate it and the vine died. And what happened to Jonah? He instantly was angry because that's where his heart was at. That's who he is in the soil of his heart. So what is the answer? The answer is something that we don't see here in Jonah. The answer is where we see in a separate scripture. If you turn over to Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3, 
And Jeremiah had lived through the same thing that I just described about the destruction of Jerusalem. And notice in verse 19, the weeping prophet Jeremiah says this, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I remember them well, and my soul is downcast within me. He remembered everything that I described that Jonah went through. Jeremiah saw it also. And Jeremiah says, when I remember that, I'm depressed. See, what we dwell on, our emotions will follow that. But there's a change between Jonah and a difference between Jonah and uh, Jeremiah. And we see that in the next verse, verse 21. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. You see, to begin to change the soil of our lives so that we're fruitful... So, so there's that beauty of the orchard, and, and there's the, the value of the orchard, and there's the value add of the orchard to others. To have that, there has to be a change in our thinking. That's why Romans 12.1 says to be transformed in the renewing of your mind. You see, if we constantly dwell on those things in the past that went wrong, it is going to embitter our soul. So what does he put his mind on? Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Verse 22, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Excuse me. Those of you that read Sports Illustrated, you've heard the name Rick Riley, and uh, he's an award-winning uh, writer that writes predominantly for uh, Sports Illustrated or ESPN. And in April of 2011, he wrote an article about Chris Paul. Chris Paul is, is the Los Angeles Clippers point guard, I think a Hall of Famer eventually, maybe we could debate that. And uh, this is what he wrote. On the moonless night of November 15, 2002, five boys ran across a park, jumped a 61-year-old man, and killed him, all just for his wallet. That man was Nathaniel Jones, the grandfather of future NBA star Chris Paul. Nathaniel Jones, the man everyone called Papa Chili, was the first black man to open a service station in North Carolina. And both Chris and his brother worked at it. Papa Chili was known to let people run tabs when times got tough. Plenty of times he handed people money out of the cash register to get by. Paul called him my best friend. After learning of his grandfather's death, Paul, who at the time was a high school senior, was so woebegone he was literally sick. Two days later, he scored 61 points for West Forsyth High School, one for every year of Papa Chili's life. He purposely missed a free throw at the end, then collapsed into the arms of his father in tears. Today, the boys who murdered Papa Chili are men sitting in prisons across the state of North Carolina, some serving 14-year terms, some life. The five were about the same age as Paul, the same race, same height, and from the same hometown. Paul, now 25, said... Those guys were 14 and 15-year-olds at the time with a lot of life ahead of them. I wish I could talk to them and tell them I forgive you, honestly. I hate to know that they are going to be in jail for a long time. I hate it. Rick Riley then admitted that he can't fathom Paul's willingness to forgive his grandfather's killers. If strangers had murdered his grandfather, Riley says, I'd want them in prison 100 years after they were in the dirt. So what was the difference with Chris Paul? On the NBA.com website in 2008, fans were writing in different questions for Chris Paul, mostly about basketball, but one fan wrote this question, Hey Chris, are you a Christian? And Chris Paul answered, Yes, I grew up in the church and I still go every Sunday if I don't have practice. It's always something that my parents instilled in me. I've grown to be pretty devout in my faith. Dr. Neil Anderson led us in an exercise then. He's saying that 
if that one of the places, the doors that we leave open where uh, demonic powers can get uh, a foothold in our soul, a foothold in our home, a foothold around us is with bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment, rage in our souls. And he said, we need to close that door and we need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to get rid of that so that there is no point of contact that the demonic powers can have inside of us. And so that's what I want us to do in just a, these few moments that we have left together is to pray about this, to do what I was taught back in 1996 in La Mirada, California at, at Talbot Theological Seminary. And so, Marcus, if you would come and, and play this atmosphere of worship, and if you want to, as a congregation, uh, to close your eyes, just giving you some privacy before God. We're just going to go to prayer. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to raise a hand. I have nothing against that, but I'm not going to do that. This is for you. But I'm just going to lead you in that exercise that Dr. Anderson led us in in the late 90s. That I've led many people through this behind closed doors as a pastor, and I've seen God do miracles in people's lives. And what we're going to pray in just a moment is just ask the Lord if there's anyone that we need to forgive to bring that name to mind. And don't resist it. Don't question it. Just trust by faith that God's going to do that. And names are going to come to mind. I do this on a semi-regular basis, frankly. Because it's not something to do just one time. It's something to do over and over again, kind of like going to the gym. And so, Lord, I thank you for each person here. You know them by name. You know their story. You know the burdens that they bear. You know the strengths and the talents and the abilities and the dreams that you gave them. You know, Lord, how hard it is on this planet with the evil world system and Satan and our own sin nature that, we're, that we just get so tired of that warfare, Lord. But we thank you, Father, that Jesus took all of that on the cross and then rose victorious over hell and over death and sat down at the right hand of the Father and then sent his Holy Spirit so that we could have victory, so we could live a fruitful life, that the fruit of the Spirit could be in our lives. And so, Father, I pray right now that you would just speak to us and just bring to our mind any names of people that we just need to forgive. As names come to mind, just remember that forgiveness is saying, I'm not going to hold them in debt anymore. I'm going to write off the debt of what they owe. You remember Jesus told the parable of the servant that owed the master $744 million in today's currency. And he fell before the master and he said, please forgive me, give me time, I'll pay it back, even though there's no way that he could ever do that. And remember what the master said in Jesus' story? He said, it, it's, it's forgiven, I wipe it out. And then Jesus said that that person who was forgiven $744 million of debt went out and he saw someone who owed them $20,000 in today's money. That's, that's quite a bit of money in, in my world anyway, but it's, a, it's not anywhere near $744 million. And you remember the, the man that owed him the 20000 said the same thing, fell in front of him, said, you know, hey, give me time, we'll work out a payment plan. It may take me 10 years, but I can pay this back. And he said, no, I'm going to call the police. I'm going to have you hauled off to jail for fraud. And you remember what the king said, the master said? He said, wait a second, I forgave you this huge debt. Would you please forgive your fellow servant a significant but not nearly anywhere as big a debt? And that's what we do. You just say, I'm going to write off the debt. It's not saying that what they did is right. 
It's not saying that they shouldn't be punished, but it's saying if they're to be punished, that's between them and God. That's for God. God is the judge. And it's to free you up. It's to let go of that. Because it's just a burden. It, it, it just sucks the life out of us. So as names come to mind now, say, yes, I just forgive that debt. I forgive them in the name of Jesus. Don't worry about the emotions of it. That may happen now. It may happen later. Don't worry about that. Just make the choice of the will. I forgive so-and-so. Maybe one of the names that comes to mind right now is yourself. I don't know about you, but for me, Satan reminds me all the time of my sin in the past. And I feel shame and condemnation, and I have to remind myself of who I am and who God is. That His grace is greater. That when sin abounds, grace abounds even greater and so just accept that you're forgiven let it go let it go well it's unforgivable that's what Jesus came to the cross to do was to forgive the unforgivable so it's covered maybe God comes to mind you feel very disappointed with God Many times we do that because we put the face of our earthly parents onto the face of God. And that's not who He is. He's a good God. And just say, God, I just want to take care of that. The fruit of forgiveness. You say, well, how do I know when this is taking place? How do I know the soil of my heart is is?" turning into something that can support great fruitfulness. It's joy, it's love, it's peace. It's peace. Heavenly Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that as people even now are obeying your word, O Lord, to forgive as you have forgiven us, I thank you, Lord, that you're setting us free and you're changing us deep within our souls. And I pray fruitfulness, and I pray peace, and joy, and love, and creativity, and abundance over each person that is here and over their household. And I pray against, in the name of Jesus, every demonic stronghold, and we bind that in the name of Jesus that they and their children and their grandchildren may be fruitful vines in the household or the orchard of God. I pray a blessing over RCF. It's been such a blessing already to my family. And I thank you for Pastor Felix and Katani and bless them and give them rest. Lord, as we move into the summer months, may it be months of rest in you, Lord. Not heaviness, but restoration of a fruitful soil in our hearts and our minds and we would give you all the glory and all the praise for you are so good Lord we bless you in Jesus precious name and all God's people in agreement said Amen, Amen.